Right. <laughs> Welcome to the Bob Unger Show. We're very privileged <coughs> to have Dr. Stephen Soloway, who's the author of Medical Politics and another great book. Called, there you, there's the book. And I have it as well. <laughs> Dueling Books and uh, Bad Medicine. And with us is Doc. Uh, there it is. And with us is Dr. Alan Katz, who um, is not only a doctor, he's also a lawyer. So you really got to watch out for him. <laughs> he's a double threat. So at any rate, I'm going to let Dr. Katz speak with Dr. Soloway about about Dr. Soloway's book and about what the communists have done to medical care. Yeah, well, nice to uh, meet you, Dr. Soloway. Yeah, I read your book uh, over the last few days, and I was uh, very interested in a lot of things you said. In fact, I felt like sometimes uh, I was reading my own thoughts, because you, I totally echo a lot of the thoughts that you had. I've been talking about the things that you talked about, how medicine has become corporatized. You have to work. Doctors are now working for the big centers. Uh, they have no autonomy. They have no free speech. Um, and, uh, you know, you will lay this out in your book where we're beholden to the, the big hospitals, the government and the insurance company. Uh, right. And, and big pharma is also another player there. So what I wanted to ask you about though, uh, in your book, obviously you didn't talk about this, but I want to talk about, uh, the whole experience we've had with the COVID, uh, pandemic, as I call it over the last few years and tie that in to the views that you have, because I think there's a lot of things that are very well illustrated in your book that uh, uh, are, are happening today with the with the COVID. Um, so I, I was just wondering your take on the way the, the this vaccine was put out um, and uh, the way COVID was sold as this disease that's going to kill everybody. I'm going to try and answer that in a uh, staged approach and hit the topics that are what I consider to be bullet points for the audience. First, I believe COVID was manufactured for military purposes. I believe that the manufacture was done in China because it was cheaper than doing in the United States. I believe it was done in China because there were no regulations in China. I do believe the U.S. government did fund the money, and I do believe that they made a, um, a bioterror uh, bio um, virus, and I do believe that it was initially released for one of two reasons. I used to be a staunch believer that it was released to thin the herd in Hong Kong because they did not want to be seen on TV with tanks killing people because nobody would do business with them. So I think that they figured, you know what? We'll put out this virus. We'll kill off 100,000 protesters. We'll come in and save the day with a vaccine or with a treatment or something. But it got out of control. And the minute they see it get out of control, they stop all flights to China and continue allowing flights to attack the US and, and Europe. So that's my stage one answer. Now, with respect to vaccine response and so on, the US government and or its allies and or its proxies, uh, whether it's the FBI, the CIA, whether it's the Department of Justice, whether it's Homeland Security, whether it's HHS, OIG, whoever it is, um, I believe that they tried to give an appearance to the public that things were being done rapidly and we need to hurry up and do something. Some of what they did or proposed or didn't or didn't propose, some is legal or illegal, some is ethical or immoral. So I'll hit a few points. Wearing a mask, which is basically a rag or a bag on your face, is completely useless in 100% of situations. Wearing an N95 is a matter of understanding what N95 means and 
uh, you you filter out 95% of particles that are larger than three microns. And those are, um, uh, the N is nitrogen. So there's a P95, which takes out the oil-based or petroleum. So everyone needs to understand, but you don't hear anyone ever say what the hell an N95 means, but this is what it is. It takes out 95% of particles that are airborne and those particles have to be larger than three microns. The COVID viron is 0.9 microns. And granted, some will say that those 0.9 micron particles are usually going to be attached to something larger. And therefore, when they are attached to something larger, they will not penetrate the N95. Well, in the lab, that may work great, except I did not notice any soldiers being deployed or being provided with N95 masks in the battlefield. In fact, these people are given um, whatever you call those things, uh, the gas mask, which filters everything and uh, it filters out 100% of particles, viruses, chemicals, and so on. So I think one big mistake was masks and not uh, military grade gear which if it were done correctly and properly, and I don't know the distribution of how it should have happened, but I do know this should be something that hopefully has been learned from and hopefully we have a plan when the next um, viral or bacterial or chemical attack comes that everybody can just throw on their mask and you know, hopefully the problem dies on the vine. But I don't know if the government is smart enough to do that. They may say there's not enough money, in which case I'd say, well, you printed six trillion dollars. I think you can buy, you know, a couple of hundred million masks, you know, not masks, uh, gas masks. You know, they have them under the Capitol. They have them under the White House. How do I know? I've seen them. I've been there. So I know they exist. There's all these hazmat suits and all this kind of stuff. Why isn't it available to you? You're a doctor. I'm a doctor. I don't have any of this stuff. But if I want to go to the hospital to get something and I'm not wearing a mask, I get some high school student yelling at me, sir, sir, you need to wear a mask. And, you know, what I want to say is, who are you to tell me anything? You're, you're a sheep. You're telling me I need to wear a mask when I know the mask irritates my face and it can't help prevent me from getting any illness. In fact, if I want to do something good for my health, I wear a scarf when it's cold. So it warms the air so I don't get reactive airways and I wheeze and sneeze and I cough less. Okay, so that was two points that I hit regarding COVID. The vaccine, which they've now admitted is a um, gene therapy. I can't say, because I'm not an expert, I can't say whether gene therapy is good or bad. However, nor can they. Um, so I think for public perception, let's hurry up and get out, you know, whatever we can, because technology has improved to the point where instead of dialing the telephone like this and looking into the thing, uh, now you pick up some device that looks like this and we could look at each other like we are now and we're, we could be on different parts of the world. So the fact that it took four or six months to make a vaccine I'm not surprised by that, only because technology is more advanced, computers are faster, et cetera. However, this is not a vector vaccine, and people were deceived. And many people did not want gene therapy, and many side effects have come out, whether it's myocarditis or the litany of problems, the long COVID, there's 50 symptoms. We could spend all day talking about that, but I'm not a COVID expert, so we'll we'll just say that I'm aware of it. I don't like it. I understand. Um, so I hit three of the topics. Um, is there anything specific that you want me to hit that I didn't pertaining to COVID? Because maybe I just forgot. Well, a few things. <clears throat> Number one, in the beginning, don't you uh, feel that we were unduly frightened that anybody who would get COVID was at a high risk of dying, and they were throwing out crazy numbers. And as it turns out, especially if you if you exclude the very elderly, you find that the death rates, and they're probably exaggerated because they called a lot of deaths from other things 
with COVID from COVID. You know what I mean? And so the question is, why did they scare everybody and insist that everybody be locked down and businesses close and kids can't go to school and you can't earn a living and all these things when when the risk to to kids and to healthier adults, uh, middle age, younger middle age, was was minimal. So this go this First goes back. Flu. This goes back to my belief that um, we are in a socialist country and fascism is here. You are giving the you are given the illusion that you own something, but you don't. They own you, which is what fascism is. The government owns you. Even if you have a private practice, which I do, I'm owned by the government. I'm not naive enough to know that it's another way. So um, to your points, why did they put up this air of fear? Well, that's how you can control people. Um, you take away their weapons. You don't let them go out. You don't let them travel. What I'm curious is, they scared people enough where there wasn't a, a, um, a civil war. And, and I'm not talking about January 6th. I'm talking about people not being able to see their loved ones in a nursing home. This to me is unconscionable. This is how they treat people in the gulag. This is how they, you know, you notice China and North Korea don't have a death rate from COVID. Well, the death rate's 100%. You're put in a, a camp and you're shot. Um, and for those who don't know that, that is true. That's what they do. And for the other people in Shanghai, where there's too many of them to shoot, they weld them in their house and they die of starvation. So in this country, they put the fear of God on you, but even our own government and military is not prepared to go street by street welding people in their home because then they will have started a civil war because most Americans are armed. Now, this, I don't, I, tell me if I'm off you know, gear and put me back on track, but the Second Amendment gives you the right to defend yourself militarily against the government. The problem is, is that when that was written in 17, whatever, you know, one guy had a bayonet and another guy had a musket. Now they have drones, tanks, missiles, and they can see through your house and know where you're standing with the heat. And you, if you're lucky, have an AK-47. Well, even if you got a 5,000 round magazine, you're outnumbered a million to one. So the Second Amendment no longer applies. People don't see that. You know, I, I think at this point in time, and I realize I'm a little off topic from COVID, but it's, it's sort of similar in the it's sense- It's all related, all related. Every American who is not mentally ill, is not an alcoholic, is not- you know, a career criminal, every American should be carrying a weapon, uh, not a weapon, a, a pistol or, or a handgun, because that will stop all these crazy shootings and all these lunatics. You know, uh, some guy got arrested for uh, shooting a, a, an, arm, an armed robber. I think it was in Dallas or something. The guy walked in, he put a gun to the face of the, the cashier and he ripped off everything. And as he was walking out, uh, uh, one of the customers shot him. And they want to put the guy who shot him on trial. Are you kidding me? He said, that's a hero. A hero saved the day so that guy can't go rob another store and put the fear of God or injury in other people. So since we can't protect ourselves against the government, we can, we can protect ourselves against government policies that are trying to eliminate our freedom more and more and more and you know they have 15 year plans because it takes 15 years reagan said it and it's true and everyone else who thinks any thinking man will understand that it takes 15 years to brainwash a generation i mean look at the people now that are 15 to 30 years old good luck having a conversation of any intelligence <laughs> with a kid. i mean come on it's just not going to happen I saw last night, it was on one of the Fox channels, and I'm not advocating for Fox, but they they showed a girl uh, who was wearing a uh, T-shirt, which had, you know, you know uh, flowers and who the hell knows. But they said to her, who do you like, Trump or Biden? Biden. Why do you like Biden? Well, he's not a racist like Trump is. Well, can you give me an example of how Trump is a racist? 
And she goes, no, but everyone knows, you know, he's just a racist. He talks <laughs> shit. He's a racist. <laughs> and well, what has Biden done for you? That's so good. What, you know, can you cite examples of what he does? Well, what do you mean? He's the president. He's good. <laughs> so this is what you get out of a, the, the, this girl, whoever she was, she's not a Republican. She's not a conservative. She's not a liberal. She's an idiot. <laughs> so right now the system is breeding idiots, but there's a reason for it. There's a reason that we're like 90th in schools, you know, in math. You know, why is the average 10th grader at a fifth grade math level? Because the government wants it that way. Why is the reading level at a fifth grade level? Because the government wants it that way. Why did my practice become computerized after 20, 25 years after I'm happy writing notes and all the doctors love my notes? Why do I have to computerize? Because when I'm sleeping, they have to investigate me. How do they investigate me? They read my charts. There's no restriction. You know, if, by the way, if you were to put up a firewall and restrict the government, they would come to your office with 15 armed guys with machine guns and you'd be taken out embarrassed and you'd lose everything because the public perception, because, you know, let's be honest, there's a lot of smart people out there, maybe a million or two or three, but there's 297 million who believe everything they see in here. Those are the sheep, you know. This is not a this is not a class issue. This is not a money issue. This is a brainwashing by the government. And, you know, those of us, including myself, who, quote, believe in authority and are obedient to authority to a degree, you know, the speed limit is a uh, is a guideline in some states. It's 70 in other states. It's 65 in other states. It's 60. How can it be against the law to drive 70? If the speed limit anywhere in the country is 70 and in your state, it's 60, you're not a criminal. It's sunny out that day and you're just driving. Now, on the flip side, you got to be pretty damn stupid if you're not driving 30 in a snowstorm, even though the sign says 65. It doesn't say slow down in the snow. So somebody writes these rules for the lowest common denominator, medicine or anything else. So you put these rules out there made by one guy who's you know slightly above average and those rules apply now to 297 million people who can't think for themselves and it's very sad and if one of those sheep who gets incentivized to be a whistleblower sees you jaywalk they immediately will take your picture on their cell phone mail it to somebody and try to get you fined so they can get you know 30 percent of the fine that, that's what this country has come to it's uh yeah. My, my mom, my, my mom and dad both passed last year, but my mom always said to me from the time I was 30 until, I don't know, until she became ill when I was in my late fifties, I guess she always said, you know, you're lucky the, the world is, you know, crazy, terrible, but the worst, you know, the Hitler days, they're behind us. And I said, no, no, mom, ahead. <laughs> I said, you're not. I said, you're no longer on top of the news. You're no longer keeping up with current events. I said, Mom, we, we have, um, you know, we have uh, Putin exterminating people. We have uh, China exterminating people. We have other, we have somewhere in East Africa, they're exterminating people. I mean, you know, look, you got this, uh, you got this genius, uh, uh, Elam Omar, um, throwing her off that committee was a um, whoever got her off the committee, they, those people should get Nobel Prizes because I want to know who these 750,000 people that voted for her are and do they really even exist? I think a woman like that needs to be investigated by the CIA to see if she's not a, um, a terror cell for, you know, an Iranian proxy. You know, the, that woman, the CIA is too busy investigating you and me, not her. True, true. But, you know, I would think that her place in society would be to be the king of Djibouti or something or, you know, the princess of, um, of uh, you know, what's where she comes from below Djibouti, Somali. Uh, Somali. Yeah, it's all the same. Somali, Djibouti. <laughs> but this video is about to be uh, taken <laughs> off <laughs> once this is on, <laughs> if we keep going this way. <laughs> But let me go. Let me uh, segue to something else. So this is another thing that really bothers me a lot. In that, when you come out with a, a an mRNA vaccine, never done before, right? Brand new right. technology, very quick testing. And in fact, they stopped the testing. Pfizer eliminated the control arm after a few months, as you probably know. 
And how do you then go down the line and see, like, are there, you know, worse side effects in the, in the vaccinated than the unvaccinated? You can't. But the thing that really bothered me, after all that, many people, including myself, but a lot of very, very, I think, very credible people question a lot of this. They question the lockdowns, like that, the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, they questioned uh, the safety of the vaccines. They question the need to even vaccinate the vast majority of the population that is at such low risk. Um, and all the people that publicly questioned this were silenced. They were silenced by social media. If they had a Twitter account, it was either taken down or they did something called shadow banning so that nobody would see it. They did this on Facebook, Google, et cetera. Um, and this is the thing that, which is really apropos to what you were saying of the society we live in. With the government now, it's not only that they they tell us things that are propaganda and false, but anybody who wants to counter that is silenced. Yes. And I think that's the most dangerous thing because everybody. And that's the most truthful thing. Yeah. Yeah. But that, you know, Hitler, when he started out uh, with his propaganda, he did something very smart. He made sure that anybody who opposed him was silenced, killed or intimidated and silenced. And that's the thing that I think is the most dangerous. If you still have a population that can speak out and counter the government's propaganda, you have a chance. But when the government is working, by the way, as we now know, in totally in tandem with social media to silence any criticism of the vaccine, then I think we really are headed in the direction you're talking about. I knew this 10 years ago, and I'll tell you why. When the government decided that AT&T and Philip Morris were too big, they broke them up because they were not in the interest of the government. Well, now that the government's in bed or the CIA or the FBI are in bed with the social media, you don't see anybody trying to break up um, the 10 companies that are under the heading of Meta, which is Facebook, or um, you know, pick your Instagram or right. whatever, TikTok, Google. Well, Google has YouTube. They right. Have right. Yeah, yeah. So yes. the whole point that... Those companies have allowed to reach market caps in the case of Apple of two trillion dollars, almost three at one point. Yes, but do you realize how much that number dwarfs wherever AT and T maxed out or wherever Philip Morris maxed oh. out? Ridiculous, yeah. right? But they don't. You don't hear anybody trying to dismantle them or separate them or break them up into ten separate companies. Why? Because. In the medical socialist model, let's take a million doctors and put them into a thousand systems so we can only so we can easily control a thousand systems much easier than we control a million doctors. So if we're working with uh, the social media and we have one social media company to deal with, why would we break them up? Because now we have to deal with 10. We have a contact at this one. He'll do whatever we say. We already put a mole or two in the company. And we watch what they do from inside and we tell them what to do from outside. And it's an amazing thing over here in Great Neck, which I call. Oh, Great I, I went to high school in Great Neck. Which one? South. Oh, so did my, my boys and my daughter and, went there. And my boys too. Yeah. I graduated there in 1980. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> I was on the swim team. Yeah. I, I um, called it Great Drek, not Great Neck. Oh, no. Now it is Great Drek. <laughs> oh lord now well i don't want to get murdered but uh yeah, let's I'm just say the houthi, the houthi rebels are running great neck now oh yeah i'm i'm a, a graduate of the bronx high school of science and i have a copy of a uh notice they put out about equity grading equity grading we have to understand that minorities culturally don't do homework and therefore we can't penalize them for not doing homework. This is in great neck. I, I was asked on a show last week, what do I think of affirmative action and how it's played a role in medicine today? It's very simple. It's diluted the quality of everything about medicine. End of story. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It goes to what you just said. You're changing the standard for homework because somebody doesn't do homework. Well, that kid has to fail the class. There's none of this garbage. You can't leave somebody behind. Again, that means we're all equal. We're not all equal. Not, the three of us are not equal. 
and we never will be. We were not born equal. We will not die equal. Nobody's equal. If you if you believe me that no one's equal, then you get it. If you think everyone's be, if you I think could, everyone's equal, you got to leave. I could I could beat LeBron James one on one if you make the basket only two inches off the ground. Well, We're, his his ego is higher than ten feet tall. <laughs> but what you're talking about is they we used to have a doctrine of equal opportunity, very different, right? Now they want equal results. Very, yeah, very different. So and the standards don't you matter. All should have opportunity, but you you must work and achieve. You get the opportunity, but then you've got to do the work. And now they're saying no. Even if you don't do the work or you don't achieve, we're going to give you the same uh, grades and the same results, and you can become a doctor or you can become an airline pilot or whatever uh, without having the same quality. Uh, I pulled my son out of the first grade in Great Neck, an E.M. Baker school, and I pulled him out to homeschool him because I asked this moron who was the principal there why they're not correcting spelling. And she said, oh, we can't correct spelling. It would hurt their self-esteem. <laughs> this is what's happening. It's communism writ large in every field of life. And do you worry at all? Because frankly, I don't care at my age. Do you worry at all about the uh, various fascist agencies going after you? They they already are. It makes sense. I, you know, there's a difference between do I worry about it versus when you make the statement, I'm not worried about it because of my age. Um. Personally, I mean, I'm worried for my kids. I'm worried for you. No, no. So, you know, so there's the age factor and then there's the what is your financial comfort factor? If I mean, you know, if they if they if they investigated me and, um, you know, threw me out of business, I'd still be able to I, I'd still eat the same slice of meat. But, yes, I worry because it, it, the whole tendency to suppress and to be controlled. Listen, I was born to be a self-thinker. I was raised to be a self-thinker and I will die a self-thinker. And my favorite state, if for no other reason, the New Hampshire license plate, live free or die. And that's what America is built on. If you can't live free, then you, you know, you're gonna go down with a fight. And um, yeah, I mean, this, this worries me because it interferes with the productivity of my day. Um, and I'm not even talking about earning money. It's just my productivity. If I have to be worried about who's investigating or stalking me, then I'm not as productive. And my children who, let's say they want to come in and join my practice. Well, their future is going to be met with audits and prepayment audits before they see everybody or anybody who walks in the door. How can you possibly keep up with medicine when you need to be a lawyer while you're practicing medicine? Makes sense. You know, I remember back in the 70s, I'm about uh, you know, 10 years uh, older than you. I remember a show in the 70s, Marcus Welby, and uh, Robert Young, the actor, played him. And he had an office. And in those days, he had one person working for him. Consuela was her name. She was the nurse, receptionist, and biller. Yeah. Think about that. She did it all because there was no regulations. They, he didn't have to deal with insurance audits and you know, and pre-authorizations and all the things now that, you know, roadblocks to your giving care to people. And if we don't, if we don't go back to that, yeah. that's the only chance we have to get the system back on track. I think that's going to be very difficult. By the way, yeah. to, to finish, yeah. to, to add to what you just said, I know you read the house of God. Sam Shem. Sure. Okay. Yeah. That was a great book. That was a Bible for us doctors back then. Right. Uh -huh. It was a million copy bestseller right mm -hmm. away. Yeah. And it had the praise of everybody. Do you know now it was re-released on a two millionth copy? And the book is considered garbage, misogynist. Right. Doesn't anyone right. know in 1969 there were no women there? So the fact that he was telling the story about the guys and about getting right. laid. Right. I mean, 
people, let's look at the times. Yeah, this well, guy was a brilliant. He was different. brilliant. Yeah, right, right. No, that was a great book. I really, it I, was a great. Any doctor also, it, was, it, it was too iconoclastic for today also, right? I iconoclastic things were at one point were, you know, were accepted, but now most people consider them to be, you know, uh, you know, misinformation is the word they like to use. At or, Northwell right. Hospital here in Great Great Drek, they're bragging on their websites about how they mutilate the genitals of children. It's on their website. It's very sad. They yeah. have their own department for that. And as well, there's a television commercial where Northwell claims that having a gun in your house is the same thing as having a wild tiger in your house. And oh. people come to the door and they said, we understand you have a tiger in this house. And they and the homeowner says, no, uh, he's not allowed to roam wild. I have him controlled. And they say, okay, very good, because that's what that's a public health issue. So my having guns is now a disease. Of course it is. It's a disease that the government has made up. Yeah. And that and that is how the medical in fact, one of my friends here, his son, went to Einstein Medical School. And he told me that he was told by somebody older than him that when he goes for his interview, he better pretend to think Obamacare is fantastic. So he plays that game. He gets into the medical school and he takes a mandatory course on the ultimate oxymoron these days, medical ethics. And the professor is talking about the great advantage of Obamacare. And he simply asked a question. He didn't even oppose the teacher. He asked a simple question and all his fellow students turned on him like it was a vampire movie when you put the crucifix in the face of the vampire and they show their teeth. He was public enemy number one for just questioning it. Well, we remind you of Germany in the early 30s when they indoctrinated all the kids and kids turned on anybody that didn't say the proper thing, turned on their parents. That's coming next. Well, doctor, we've got about uh, two minutes left. So yeah. tell the viewers the best way to get your books, yeah. the best way to keep up with what you're doing and get in touch with you. Personally signed copies of my book should be obtained at badmedicinebook.net. That is one word, badmedicinebook.net. And I'll get you out a signed book right away. I'm on YouTube, uh, Stephen with a PH, Solo AMD, one word. And um, if you go on PubMed, I've written about 20 peer review articles. Uh, my favorite topic is gout. And I, I don't know, I treat everything in rheumatology. I treat all medical orthopedics. I patented nine needles. I never met an orthopedic who could do anything better than me except cut inappropriately. Um, but anyway, badmedicinebook.net. And I'm not arrogant. I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> Yeah. Where did you get that copy of the, that uh, photo of uh, Ali and Frazier? Oh, um, so I'm in the Hall of Fame of baseball card collectors. So along oh. with my collection, I got a handful of autographs and signed stuff. But I will tell you, those two gentlemen are there for a reason. One, they're both always on the top. And I like to think I'm on the top. And two, they were both my patients. Wow. Really? That is great. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Joe Joe lived in uh, Philadelphia. That's right, that's right, and I'm south of Philadelphia now. Yeah, he was, Smoke and, and Joe daughter, died on the, he died on the way to my office. Wow, wow. Yeah, I I did a benefit because I was a professional singer, and I did a benefit at uh, Fort Dix for the troops, and it was me, him, and Tony Orlando, and he was a terrific, humble guy, as humble as could be. I really liked him. The man was built of steel. Absolutely. You put your arm on him. It's like, good Lord. It's like tapping a, a steel yeah. bar. 
Yeah, exactly. What's that picture you have on the top there? I can't make it out. Is that a baseball? What the one on the top? Up up here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is my father's PS 139 graduating class. Uh, (laughs) Where was PS 139? Um, uh, Flatbush, Brooklyn. Dad Ah, Dad is from Flatbush and mom was from uh, Harrison Avenue, the 1800 block of Harrison Avenue. Wow. It's in the good part of the Bronx today. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, God bless uh, 